she stands out from the crowd. Literally, he recognizes her by her feet. Mm -hmm. uh, And not only that, but she... Welcome into Film Tank, the weekly podcast that covers both new and classic cinema. On this episode of Film Tank, we're discussing the James Bond film on Her Majesty's Secret Service, starring George Lazenby. If you would like to get in touch with Film Tank, you can always email us at filmtankshow at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Film Tank Show. And you can listen to all of our episodes on our website, filmtankshow.com, or on iTunes. And now, here are your hosts, Nick Cheney, Toussaint Egan, and myself, Alex Diekman. Hey there, everybody, and welcome into episode 176 of Film Tank. I am Alex Diekman, along with one of my co-hosts, Nick Cheney. Well, hello there. Oh, hi. Uh... Just myself and Nick today, again, as yep. uh, Tucson has been busy for the last couple of weeks, so he has not been able to join us uh, for the last couple episodes, and won't be on the next one either, at least yeah. probably not. So, at any rate, uh, continuing with this, even though these episodes probably won't get posted until late December or early January, we are... They'll be there for next Christmas. There it is. That's the like where our head's at. We're going to discuss today another film that revolves around the Christmas season, but isn't necessarily a holiday film. And that is the James Bond film on Her Majesty's Secret Service, the sixth film uh, in the series, and the first and only with George Lazenby portraying James Bond. So this film uh, is directed by Peter R. Hunt, who uh, direct, or also did other things, but did not do much directing throughout his career. Uh, and really did not do much that anyone would really know. Um, and also, too, uh, as I mentioned, stars George Lazenby in his only appearance. And also has Telly Savales, who portrays Blofeld in this film. <laughs> yeah. And also uh, features Diana Rigg as the yeah. Bond girl Tracy. Hell yeah. Now, when I was looking up and you were saying that she was very... Famous oh, yes. uh, beforehand, um, I always knew her because I thought I recognized her in this film, but could not place her. Uh, she plays uh, the f- wealthy female. Um, I don't know if she's a museum owner or operator, or exactly what she is, but she is in the Great Muppet Caper. Oh yes. That is correct. And she has the baseball diamond that uh, gets stolen by her shitty brother yep. and blames that on Miss Piggy. Awesome. <laughs> Classic. I know. So anyways, um, those are the three main players here. We have some other people show up, including Desmond Llewellyn, who plays Q, who um, hmm. portrayed Q all the way up through some of the Pierce Brosnan yeah. films. So yeah, he was I, around for a long time. I was going to say, I think he's the longest running actor in the entire franchise. Yeah. So, um, two things. A, if you're not able to notice, I'm a little under the weather today. Uh, if you hear multiple coughs throughout the episode. It was me. Uh, but, that being said, uh, this is also a film that was completely suggested by Nick Cheney, as this is not only one of his favorite James Bond films, but also just one of his favorite films in general. So I will let him start off and uh, talk some more about this James Bond film, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Thank you very much, Alex. It's great to be here. I know. I, actually, I didn't oh, even read okay. the. Uh, I didn't even I read guess the. I'll just uh, go fuck myself. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I did not even read the uh, plot synopsis, so I should probably do that. James Bond woos a mob boss's daughter and goes undercover to uncover the true reason for Blofeld's allergy research in the Swiss Alps that involves beautiful women from around the world. That's about right. Actually, yeah. That's uh, pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, now that that's out there, go right ahead, sir. All righty. Yeah. Uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is uh, definitely an anomaly in the James Bond uh, franchise uh, as a whole. Um, it's hard to talk about the movie because 
So much of the cultural conversation, I think, around James Bond is who is your favorite James Bond? And I feel like that always supersedes, like, what's your favorite James Bond film or what's your favorite James Bond set piece, you know? Because George Lazenby is in no way my favorite James Bond, but this is easily my favorite film in the entire, uh, I don't know how long, like, 40-year or whatever, 50 years maybe, I think, um, span that this franchise has been going for. Um, I think it is probably the most emotional Bond that's ever been made, even if most of that emotion rests upon that final act, uh, especially the final scene where, uh, spoilers, uh, (laughs) James Bond gets married, yay, and his wife is killed. (laughs) <laughs> and um, but the movie earns it by that point, in my opinion. Um, Tracy, throughout the whole film, uh, even if she disappears for a while, but that's kind of a uh, necessity of the plot. Um, she's always uh, on equal footing with James. Um, in fact, the movie opens almost uh, slyly with her trying to kill herself because of her depression in the face of uh, her. I guess you call it like elite status and kind of nothing means anything if I'm just the if I'm if I'm labeled as just the mob uh, boss's daughter and can't really live a life outside of that shadow um and yet James Bond uh, foolishly tries to save her uh and actually just ends up getting his ass kicked instead which I think it's kind of funny um yeah that action sequence actually was fan fucking tastic uh, it felt like the old Adam West Batman in terms of the oh, way yeah. that the violence is portrayed. Oh, yeah. It, the sound design in this film is just hilarious to me, but <laughs> in a good way, because every single punch or just something breaking is just turned up to, t- like, 11 for no real reason, but it just it's great. And yet, with that kind of cartoonish violence, it's in this film exclusively, it's almost always shot in extremely gorgeous locales or uh, meticulously designed set dec- uh, decoration because that means that the scene on the beach is super cartoonish, but that they're shooting on a gorgeous uh, beach with a vista behind them where it's kind of they, – they almost shoot almost every outside scene either during sun up or sun down. Like they never do it just – Almost in straight daylight. Well, and even the um, one of my favorite scenes in the film was the uh, the car chase scene that actually ends up on a racetrack yeah. uh, during the middle of the night, pretty much, yeah. uh, in complete darkness, and they're driving on snow, um, and I thought that was a beautiful scene, yeah. um, and it was, you know, probably one of the easier ones to shoot, I would think, just because you have, you, you have to mess with the lighting, but... When you, it's completely dark, you have no yeah, you get, light limiting factors. Exactly. So. You could just put it where you want it. Right. And you don't have to block it. Um, but it still worked out wonderfully. And that look of the bright red and blue cars driving on the white snow in a film shot in the you know late 1960s uh, was was just gorgeous. Absolutely. And um, e- even some of the minor scenes, uh, like when he's first taken to uh, Tracy's father's house, and he goes through all that kind of industrial whatever, um, like that's for no real reason lit up with green lights in one room, red lights in another. And um, I kind of really dig this kind of uh, almost psychedelic uh, background noise that's going on. And it kind of all comes to the head, too, once he gets to Blofeld's uh, lair, whatever, the, the, the compound, because that place is crazy. That's like... It's a weird crossbreed between, like, French skiing village, but also, like, an extremely minimalist modern Ikea. Like, it's it, it just kind of, like, it. every room has its own rules in there, and uh, but it always looks gorgeous. And because it's set around Christmas time, there's plenty of lighting uh, choices and just great decorations around. Yeah, and that... That look of that is amazing, but that whole sequence in general is so weird. Um, mostly for me because it seems like, and I, I mean, this is not like a comparison that's totally ridiculous, but there's definitely comparisons in terms of the kind of people that Blofeld and James Bond are, that they have, they have 
similar ways about going about things, even if they're on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you. Son of a bitch. Anyways, uh, the idea that uh, all these people who are being picked for these allergy huh, things are beautiful women. Now, that's that's weird. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, I, like, I like how they're all um, playing. Uh, also, they're they're curling for fun. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Uh, no, and actually, you bring up a good point, because I think if you take away the main meat of this, which is two things, which is Bond versus Blofeld and Bond with Tracy, mm -hmm. uh, you do have that kind of subplot about the women in that compound. And for me, I don't mind, because I know you are probably going to at least touch on this, and so I will just preemptively say that while it gets short change because they're certainly pretty much dismissed right away after uh they're after everything kind of is found out and whatnot yeah um i kind of appreciate their place in this movie because i kind of like this almost overindulgence in the trope that is a bond girl which is to put them all in a room and literally let uh bond have a playground of them uh but also uh, kind of subtly acknowledges that, yeah, the only people who would actually act this way are if they're brainwashed and uh, kept in captivity, so to speak. So while I, while I do think it kind of goes nowhere, it's also kind of hilariously uh, comments on a lot of things that have come before in the franchise, which this movie itself is also pretty upfront about. I mean, the op uh, opening line before the uh, main titles is George Lason be literally looking at the camera and say, this never happened to the other fella. Yeah. Um, so I do think that there's a playfulness here with the franchise's history, uh, which was at that point not that big or long. No, I mean, this is the sixth film, and we've now had 24. Yeah. So, you know. But even by that point... They were already starting to recognize the uh, kind of ridiculous uh, monotony of what Bond does. Yeah, I will say uh, this is not a super short film. You know, for 1960s standards, this was a two-hour and 23-minute film, so this is pretty lengthy. Yeah. Um, to spend 40 to 45 minutes on that storyline, which is what it felt like to me, and then to have it come to an abrupt end was very bizarre. Yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you want to go into any general thoughts? No, but why don't you, if you want to finish yours, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, so just to wrap that up in general, I, I think this is just an incredibly playful film. I think it's so uh, weirdly conceived. I mean, the final product is just such a weird hodgepodge of psychedelic, psychotronic uh, set decor with... And actually kind of progressive Bond. I mean, yeah, he's a woman either, but he also doesn't seem like a woman raper, which there's a distinction. And certainly Bond can be either or <laughs> yeah. of those things. So um, I'm not saying he has to be one or the other, but certainly it's nice after the very uh, lecherous Sean Connery, uh, who I actually really like as Bond. But that is a defining characteristic of his <laughs> of his Bond. Um yeah, it's just kind of funny that, uh, you know, this is the one where, like, the – I'll, I'll end it with this. This is the movie in which could have set a template for those – for things to come, but obviously was rejected at the time of its release uh, because it almost basically inverted Bond by saying that the – the main world domination type plots are very silly, in this case literally, and Blofeld hiding his, you know, scheme behind allergy research with uh, voluptuous women. But the Bond girls are actually where James Hart is at, which in this case is with Tracy. It, You know, it kind of emphasizes the things that are usually on the outskirts and downplays the things that most Bond films usually try to play up as serious drama. Mm. And I, I just enjoyed that kind of inverse. And, of course, it taking place at Christmas time is just a delight. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of this movie, and this definitely... Every winter season, now that I've seen it, at least. Because uh, mm -hmm. I only saw it like a couple of years ago when our friend of the show, Sarah, showed it to me, which was a few years ago. And this was probably the film that, like, after I saw it, then I finally was like, okay, I'll watch all the other Bond movies. <laughs> like, eventually, at least. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, this is an extremely enjoyable film for myself. Good. Yeah, I didn't uh, didn't think this was very bad. Um, I thought this was actually pretty decent. 
Uh, this is not my favorite Bond film, nor my least favorite that I've seen, and I've probably seen about half of them at this point. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning the relationship that Bond has with um, Bond has with Tracy in this film. And I would actually compare it, and I'm sure that a lot of the um, structure was taken somewhat from this film. Uh, in the first Daniel Craig film, Casino Royale, where he has a very similar relationship with the Bond girl in that film, played by Ava Green. Um, and he, she is still the girl that he's pining after, even through Spectre. Um, and I'm guessing that that story is probably going to be dead now. The Lea Seduce character is there. Yeah, true. But at the same time, um, that film also ends with Ava Green um, slipping from his grasp. So, somewhat similar in terms of that. Yeah. Overall, though, uh, I think this is a very fun film, but not necessarily my favorite kind of Bond film. I uh, I guess it just hurts for me because I I... I hate to say that like the films that have come out during my lifetime are the ones that I prefer, but probably just because those are more geared towards the kind of things that I expect to see in films. Um, and I've never given too much time to the older films. And I think it's because I don't necessarily love the wacky, playful silliness that happens throughout them all the times. Uh, yeah. But that being said, this film is doing it what it does very well, and uh, it has serious moments that really do uh, land quite well. Um, and its playful moments also are, are done quite well. Um, and I don't have too, too much to say about it, but at the same time, I think that it's a, it's a well-done early Bond film that does make me feel like... It's a little bit sad that George Lazenby didn't get another chance to play Bond. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are reasons why he was moved on from. But at the same time, um, I would certainly rather watch any other film of his as James Bond than Timothy Dalton or Roger Moore. Yeah. So I no, I, yeah. I'm with you. And there's actually supposed to be a really good documentary out. That's mm. uh, I forget what it's called, but it's probably very easy if you just Google search. Lazenby Bond documentary, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm 99% sure it's streaming on a lot of services, but it details the entire, like, the one-hit wonderness of him being Bond and, like, how it even came to be, and then, of course, why it never came to be again. And mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people raved about it. I still need to see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, are you... No, I mean, I, I um, you know, I have particular things that I'd like to chat with you about about this film. But overall, I thought this was, you know, a, a solid Bond entry that uh, I don't remember too many specific details just off the top of my head. Um, but I'm sure if we get talking more about it and you talk about more specific things that you like about the film, more will come to mind uh, as it's been a week or so since we watched this. So yeah. um, I guess I'll just pass it back off to you. Oh, well, I guess I will say this and, yeah. uh, and this can start our conversation about it. One thing I did find, I wasn't sure if I liked or didn't like, and I'm still not sure, is that um, we get to the end after the chase scene between Bond and Blofeld through the toboggans, which was kind of cool. And then we go to the wedding, and then we have the very abrupt ending to the film after um, she's murdered uh, from Blofeld. And it happens so quickly. Um how do you feel about the very ending of this film? So she is not murdered by Blofeld. No. Remember that actually it's kind of – it is extremely abrupt, but it is actually set up well because okay. she is murdered by uh, Ilsa Bontz, Okay. the German lady who was chasing him before the whole Blofeld thing. Right. And it does – this movie does go out of its way to point that they never died and that they basically just, you know, like swerved mm -hmm. off the road in, in the very uh, – so, technically speaking, yeah, it's him and, and her one henchman. Now, I can't remember if Blofeld, I don't, now it's been a while, but I don't think he, but it's her who's basically doing the whole shit. But he's with her. Is he? Because I remember seeing both of them, and I thought that he was the one. But okay. I, I will say this, it happens yeah. really fast, Yeah. and 
I get that it's kind of done on purpose, but that was something that I thought was very weird that that was the ending part of it because you had a two hour and 22 minute film that did have a little bit of filler in it. And to have this dramatic finale uh, to your film, and even if it's not the point that right. you're trying to make, because the film does end with this almost sobbing uh, James Bond as his wife is laid dead in his arms, which is no, a very... She, she's just resting. Okay. Uh, that's what he tells the passerby. Uh, it is a very powerful moment for a James Bond film. But the lead up to it is happens very quickly. And I guess it's on purpose because he didn't know what was happening. So the audience should know what's happening. But at the same time, um, I just found that scene to be a little bit strange. But the very ending of it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. No, I agree in that. <clears throat> in a lot of ways, it comes out of nowhere uh, as far as editing-wise and whatnot. Um, I guess I'll split the difference with you and say okay. that – I agree that there could have been more build up to it throughout the movie, but I definitely like the way it happens in media rays, like during the scene, mm -hmm. because otherwise there would have been no real reason as to why he would have got the, or she, uh, they would have got the drop on her and him. Sure. In fact, I love the fact that it only happens because he pulls the car over to go pick her flowers, mm -hmm. you know, on her wedding day or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you in the sense that for a movie that's uh, over long and has a lot of whatever. Okay. Just really quickly, because mm -hmm. I'm watching it. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> well, I'm 99% sure you are right in that he's driving the car, but it's Ilsa Bones that – because he's got the cast on his mm – -hmm. <laughs> so I do find that even kind of funny. <laughs> anyway, uh, But, yeah, Ilsa Bones is the one who uh, – looks and shoot because they think that he's in the car which i gotta say that's uh something that most other bond movies don't even take into account that you know if he's gonna i mean I, obviously that's why he's detached because he can't have loved ones but mm -hmm. to see it portrayed here that um you know that's maybe that's why he's a womanizer because this is the kind of shit that would happen if he had people in his life that he cared about and whatnot yeah uh, so, yeah, I, I think that whole final scene is uh, fantastic. Um, this movie is a it's a real wild ride, if you think about it, because for a two-hour and 20-minute movie, it takes like 50 minutes to actually get to the compound. Hmm. It has a very long first act, so to speak, from the first meeting with uh, Tracy and her father and the romance therein, not between Tracy and her father, uh, between Tracy and Bond. Not that I would judge. Um, because even after all that, he still has to like hunt down uh, the connection of the genealogist to Blofeld. And there's that great scene where they, in order to sneak up the, his tools up into the room, they put it uh, into a construction crane, yeah. whatever, just to lift it up, which is so weirdly archaic, even for Bond in the 60s, but yet awesome. Like, it's not like... Obviously, he has a gadget, but just to get it up there, he, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just toss it in there, and you just give it to me on the balcony. Well, I mean, he couldn't walk into the office right. with it. So. No, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's just we... It just if, looks... If we, if we made that movie today, we would figure out a way to make it more digital. Than well, that. he probably wouldn't need this enormous thing to crack uh, a four-digit code that either. That is true, but it looks awesome. Yeah, the way he uh, just pulls out that like huge, like I don't know, it looks like a commercial for Office Depot or something, like the... Uh, power strip that he has to plug in and it's it's like a feet in diameter this film does do a trait of technology in the 1960s and 70s perfectly spot on as any large machine makes beeping noises for no reason and oh, it's yeah. amazing no reason Whoa. those beeps are integral you bet uh that machine that uh cracks the code of the safe and then all of the machines at Blofeld's lairs are just beep, 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 boop, yeah. boop, 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 boop. Like, why, what are those doing? Hell yeah. Oh, they're doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, another reason uh, that I think Bond is a lot more playful in this movie is because even the sex or the sexual content in this movie is juvenile in a way in that some of the other, I would say, Bond films are not. For example, he just reads a Playboy magazine while he's, uh, you know, cracking that safe. 
And although he is reading it while he's walking back out in the hallway, which looks a little weird. Well, you know, he he, he was reading those articles. And sure. He, hey, well, the, the ones that pull out all the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's uh, they they got the double spacing of the. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No. In the 1960s, I'm guessing men reading Playboy in public may have been a little more. Yeah. Cool. As long as you were wearing a suit and tie. <laughs> oh, he's got a commute. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even that and to the um, kind of ravenous <laughs> interactions he has with the girls at the compound where, um, first of all, it's weird because on the one hand, I feel like it would be so easy to call this movie slightly homophobic, but I actually don't think it is. If anything, I think it's actually slightly progressive in the way that his first initial cover is that he's gay when he gets to the compound because I, I don't know. No one really cares and they also kind of see through it. So I don't know. It just, it's just, there, there's a few lies in there that I, I just kind of crack me up because I feel like no other bond, like how is it a bond from the sixties has a very casual reference that, Oh, this bond is pretending to be gay when we haven't even had that like ever since. Like, I, I just can't see a modern day bond even trying that either. Um, and yet we also have some very ridiculous line readings. Uh, for example, the, uh, the first initial girl when, uh, he goes to talk to her in her room and takes off his kilt and she's like, it's true. Oh boy. There's, there's just a lot of, a lot of good stuff happening here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, we talked about it a little bit, but I do want to point out that there's no rhyme or reason as to why the henchmen in this movie wear Olympic, uh, jackets, but, um, I'm loving it. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> Yeah. The only thing I can think of is like that's just some weird unsaid cover. Like, I, I, yeah. I mean, they're maybe they're curlers, professional curlers. <laughs> you know, that's their practice uh, compound. I suppose that is a cover, but when I saw the Olympic symbol at first, I was like, "Oh, that guy has an Olympic jacket on." But when I saw all of them wearing yeah. it, I was like, "What?" Yep. So that that let's talk about that compound for a second. Yeah. Um. I thought that was just delightful. Absolutely. Um, just the way all of the That's why room... I got a little tingly when Spectre came out and we yeah. saw that movie because he has a compound kind of similar, not similar region, obviously. Mm. But it was the first time in forever that uh, Blofeld had his own place that he invited Bond to. And I right. was like, oh, I'm getting flashbacks anyway. And unfortunately, Spectre kind of wastes <laughs> that. Yes, it does. Yeah. Literally, it goes up in flames. Well... If it would have went up in flames after an elongated scene, it would have been okay, I think. True. But since this scene only lasts about nine minutes and then it goes up in flames, it is a little wasted. But how about that shot and that explosion? Yeah, it's good. It is. It's fine. But yeah, the compound? Yeah, no, I um, I thought that compound was awesome. I love the way that it used closed off rooms and hallways to move through uh it reminded me a lot of the location and the house that was used in ex machina that's what i thought you were gonna say yeah where you could move through all of these hallways in different places and have so many different points of view while being in the same place just because every room invites some different experience whether it's his room or one of the other bedrooms, or the dining area, or Blofeld's area, or that weird area that looked like the Batcave. <laughs> like, I mean, there was... That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, this kind of closed-off, multiple-hallway area is, I thought, was very wonderful and was worked very well in film. Well, and that's also, that's kind of... That's, for me, at least, that's how you make a Bond-Blofeld movie work, which is that... You, you can only do one of two things, right? You can either do um, a movie where it's very straightforward, Bond versus Blofeld, which whether that turns into a globe-trotting adventure or a whatever, but that means they can't be in the same place for very long because otherwise the movie makes no sense. Or you do something like this where um, Bond is essentially a prisoner, whether uh, – Knowingly or unknowingly, because at first he's a character in disguise, but also really can't go anywhere considering what this compound is shaped like and obviously where it's located. Um, 
or by at least a halfway point, uh, knowingly a prisoner when he's found out, which I also kind of appreciated how that didn't take very long. Like, it was just kind of like after about a day, you know, it's like what they say about guests, you know, they start to stink, and finally Blofeld was like, ooh, pee <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. Um, and so I love that the this compound, and they kind of do it, well, they try to do it in Spectre, uh, but they also do it in uh, Doctor No, actually, the very first uh, Bond film. Uh, it kind of turns the Bond Blofeld relationship into a psychological uh, cat and mouse type game, which is not to say that it's super deep, but it's fun to watch. Uh, where, I mean, when he does literally imprison him, I love that he Im- imprisons him in a in like the back room of the. Ch- ski lift which is like extremely open ended and yeah you you have to like climb out of it but it's like the opposite of a cell it's just like a little ledge so it's like well of course any sane person would just like i i guess get adrenaline and just escape like it's just very it's very ego uh uh egomaniac so i it it fits in line with obviously the the character and whatnot but it's also very silly um, but yeah, the the set of the compound is fantastic. The the lighting, I mean, when they do the uh, the nightly treatments, uh, mm. where Blofeld gets on the or not even gets on the, but he got those recordings for each room, and they do these very uh, I don't know disco esque uh, light treatments along. Yeah, the... what? Um, and I mean, I'm sure that they didn't think it out this much. It just has these. Yeah. Weird lighting that's supposed to be a sensory type thing. But yeah, that looks so cool with the it way does. the lighting across the whole room. It makes no the... sense, but it, no. I'm glad it's there. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's uh and I feel like that's kind of this one shot as on Her Majesty's Secret Service in a nutshell, which is that in every scene and every performance it's just kinda like, why not just do the most we can with what we have? Because who knows if we'll get another one? And mm-hmm. sure enough, uh, that attitude prevailed, and uh, for uh, which ended up being prescient. But uh, yeah, all those indulgences just kind of make this movie for me. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that I I really liked is the uh, the relationship that Bond has, not only just with um, I keep forgetting it's is it Tracy? Tracy? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, with Tracy and her father. Uh, which is such a weird start to the movie because he is clearly trying to use her to get to Blofeld, but then he tries to turn the whole thing around and say, no, I, I want to get to Blofeld, but I also do want to be with you, and I'm still here, and blah, blah, blah. Um, But they end up starting this relationship, but then they separate, and then she just randomly shows up later, and then they're together again. It's just a very weird story structure with their actual relationship, and it actually kind of works, even though it's, I mean, there's some things that you kind of just have to go with, but um, it actually works really well in a very unusual James Bond relationship, because usually, um, at least from what I've seen, it's always very just... um, one-sided and yeah i was gonna say uh, I, don't, I don't know the best term for it right off the top of my head that i want to use but superficial it's, yeah, it's very it's very much just there for one specific reason and if she's there for a while and then they have sex and she goes away she will not be returning um, and, Every time James yeah. Bond has sex with a woman, she basically is like it's like Thanos snapped her finger, his <laughs> fingers. It's just dust in the wind. Yeah, and that's basically how it's gone throughout most of. I mean, even the most recent series, uh, two of the four Daniel Craig series, the Bond girls do not make it very far in them. No, so and we're living in the age where they're trying to be progressive. Like yeah. before, that was just the norm, you know, mm-hmm. just who would show up for their scene and whatnot. Whereas here, it's like they're. Tr- I mean, obviously, Ava Green has been in more than one. Well, not literally, but what, she's at least been. She's in, mentioned in okay. uh, two of the other. She's films. at least survived in the spirit. <laughs> yeah, in more than which is a lot more of a. And most. and Leah Sidhu in the last film Correct. is a much more, but. 
the two girls in the early in the um, Skyfall and uh, the one with Matthew Umerick. Oh yes, yeah. Um, Quantum of Solace. Yeah, they are complete minor characters that are whisked away very quickly. To be fair, the girl from Skyfall, uh, Severin, uh, should is just not a good match for Bond. She's no, a, no, she's a sex slave survivor, and I really don't think that uh, Bond is what she needs right now. Clearly. <laughs> I'm sorry, but she gives her entire... And I love Skyfall. Mm -hmm. But she gives her entire backstory. And Bond like... Doesn't matter. And then the next scene... He's got needs. But here's the thing. (laughs) I don't even care if they have sex. Because that's, you know, consensual loving is good loving. But the idea that he initiates it by sneaking into her shower. Just like, you know what? What about a knock? You know, just a simple, hey. You've had sex with hundreds of men. (laughs) Yes, the nymphomaniac curse. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Uh no, the uh, the relationship between uh Bond uh and Tracy in this film yeah, is circling back here. Yeah, is is fantastic and I love because it does go through a whole arc. I mean the the beginning of it with uh Bond and uh, her father where we just see two men discuss the well being of a woman and the, the term dowry even yeah. is thrown out there. Yeah, and so it's it's in very shaky territory, mm. but it actually in my opinion does not uh uh end up sinking like it it kind of reverses that in a way because first of all Bond doesn't even really want to do it. It's mostly just comes from a uh fatherly gross but fatherly perspective and then once Bond realizes that he could get something out of it that's not in relation to Tracy, uh, but the Blofeld and whatnot, then, you know, for the good of his country, maybe he will, whatever. But by the time it really kicks off, which is around the, when they meet for the at the racetrack, um, Tracy still won't actually allow Bond to go through with it in that context because she forces her dad to tell him where Blofeld is. Be, and so she assumes that, okay, now the deal's off. But what's interesting about that is that that's actually kind of like the ground zero for where Bond could have a relationship because every other Bond girl either had information that he wanted or was in some way uh, related to you know the end game. But for Tracy to give that up uh, purposefully so to make sure that there was nothing keeping him there because she's I, obviously – from the beginning, depressed and wanting to know if anyone would actually like her for who she was, uh, Bond actually steps up to the plate, which is not hard when she's Diana, Diana Rigg uh, back in that era. But uh, I don't know. I, I find it to be wonderful, especially because even by that point, once they are uh, um, starting to court uh, each other, then even the father gets second uh, uh, second ideas about it and uh, cold feet because now that he did give up the Blofeld thing, he's like, well, it, you know, he just, then he starts to act like a more normal father, which is like, well, are you sure he's good for you? You know, whatever. So I don't know. It, it takes a very gross premise, but I actually think that it follows it through to a progressive and also kind of adorable uh, trajectory. And to the point where she disappears in the film and then reappears, while I think it may be a little clumsy, I actually think it's kind of great because after Bond has been kind of gallivanting with these uh, nameless women, mm-hmm. um, once again, Tracy stands above that kind of uh, anonymous uh, sex that he usually has because she stands out from the crowd. Literally, he recognizes her by her feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not only that, but she... <laughs> uh, but she um, she shows up in the nick of time to save him. Yeah. I mean, he needs her right away, you know. And so... Um, if that's not a progressive take and a uh, a bedrock for a relationship that James Bond could be in, I, I don't know what would be. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm, I'm absolutely enamored by their relationship. I mean, it's got a uh, a barnyard love scene. Who doesn't love those? I mean, I think you kind of have to. I know. I mean, it's, it's gorgeously shot. They made do with what they had. Absolutely. So, yeah. no, I, uh, I, I mean, w- without Diana Riggs, uh, Tracy, this movie would be a pretty mediocre 
kind of like forgettable Bond. Mm-hmm. But I think because of her and what she infuses, even in scenes that she's not even in, uh, I think uh, this really takes the cake for me. Wonderful. Do you want to go to final ratings? Let's do it. All right. I'll uh, I'll start. I gave this a three out of five. Uh, I thought this was a very solid film, and it definitely had parts that I thought were enjoyable. It is a little long. It is. And it definitely could have been shorter. Uh, that being said, uh, I would not mind rewatching this at some point. And the scenes that were good were really good. So I, uh, I was a fan of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And even though it has its faults, it is a, uh, a good film with a, a very thought-provoking ending. Uh, and for a James Bond movie, that's definitely something that uh, doesn't happen every time out. So it's a three out of five for me for On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Hell yeah. I am a big fan of this movie. Um, it's definitely overlong, and it's uh, very clunky in places. I, I feel like for me... Uh, I don't really, not that I'm saying you do either or anything like that, but uh, Bond movies are never going to be perfect. So, like, mm-hmm. the way the way I overvalue this is saying, well, like, well, I'm always going to be bored by some scenes in any Bond movie, so I'd rather be bored by scenes in this movie in particular for my taste. So, uh, while I, you know, wouldn't say it's perfect or anything, uh, I probably don't really want anything else from a Bond movie, uh, personally speaking. Um, and uh, Diana Rigg is fantastic in this, and George Lacenby is actually pretty fun and charming. He's not the greatest actor in the world, but he's got the boyish uh, charm down to the point where he actually is kind of like almost unassumingly charming, other than like, uh, I would say, unlike uh, like a Sean Connor. Who's aggressively charming? <laughs> um, so you know, I He's aggressively a lot of things. Oh, very much so. <laughs> so I, I appreciated that this was a very kind of aloof Bond who was just trying to get through his day. And you know, there's also some even if they're kind of forgettable when you're watching them, they're fun to watch. I mean, the scene where uh, uh, Money Penny allows Bond and the and M to just throw their hissy fits, where Bond uh, tries to retire and then M tries to, you know, accepts his vacation, and neither one of them have any idea what the other was actually talking about because Buddy Penny wrote her own uh, memorandums and little things like that. They're, they're, it it never forgets that it's a Bond film. So, uh, yeah, I very much appreciated that. And, uh, yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think uh, the Christmassy parts are fun. And I give it a four and a half out of five. It's uh, in no way a masterpiece, but... I can't help but put it on whenever the snow starts falling around December. Nice. Good times. Well, if you out there have any thoughts uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service or really any other James Bond films, uh, we'd love to hear about it at filmtankshow at gmail.com. So, continuing with our holiday tradition uh, that we're trying to do this year, at least, uh, talking about films that center around Christmas but aren't really Christmas films, Uh, We're going to step back to 2000, the very (laughs) first year of this millennium, to a wonderful little action uh, heist film uh, that is not good, but still very fun and involves Christmas, so it's great. Uh, And that is the Ben Affleck film Reindeer Games. Uh, This is a very dumb movie. But it is compulsively watchable, I will say. And any time I've seen this on, I usually find a way to stick to it just because I watched this when I was, you know, 13, 14 when this first came out. And I thought it was enjoyable then and I uh, thought it was stupid fun and still do to this day. So uh, myself and Nick will be getting together again and talking about this coming up on our next episode. See you next week. <laughs> So from Nick Cheney, myself, Alex Diekman, thank you as always for joining us here at Film Tank. We'll be catching up with you again next time.